I'm going <clears> to <throat> talk a little bit about some of the software that I'm developing currently or have worked on in the past. Um, L switcher is a task switcher. Um, it basically comes either as a standalone version or it works um, as a X Center plugin. Um, the stuff you can't read says that it's Alt Tab and, and Control Tab are the two hot keys to pull up the uh, pop up window. Um, <clears throat> it's configurable. What I mean by the window can be sticky is by default. When you pop it up, it disappears as soon as you lift either the Alt or Control key, whichever one is the hot key. So you have to hold the Alt key down to do anything with it. But you can check to make the window sticky, which means that you can release both those keys and it will stay there. Standalone, it's a taskbar. You can put it either at the top or the bottom. It is compatible with X Center. Again, the part you can't read says that um, that's except if the widget, the L Switcher um, plugin is there. You can't run both the plugin and the standalone together. It's one or the other. <coughs> um, you can reduce the desktop also, the same feature that you have with X Center. The interesting thing about it is if X Center has already done it, it doesn't work. And the reverse is true. If, if L switcher has already done it, X center doesn't work. So you can only reduce once. <coughs> um, you, it's a decent replacement for, um, for the Windows list. The only thing that it lacks is tile and cascade. Does anybody use any of those? off the Windows list, and it has priority and several other things that are configurable, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, there's an exclude list for the pop-up, and there's a separate exclude list for the taskbar. So you could have different things available at different in different Windows. In other words, you might, if you normally use the pop-up and don't use the taskbar much, you might leave everything in the taskbar but exclude stuff out of the pop-up so you don't have to go through as many things. <coughs> you can group the icons together. What that means is if I have um, six different 4OS2 windows open for some reason, instead of having those six windows spread out, they're all stacked on top of each other. And when I hoover over them, I get a list of those windows that I can pick from. Uh, obviously, it's for space saving. And I use the, I use the X Center plugin myself. So I've got, I don't even have a full length bar. The same thing with the icons only versus icons in text. You can just leave them with icons, which obviously takes up a lot less space than having the text next to it. The bars are sizable, so you can essentially wrap the icons. So you can have more than a single row of icons, but still, obviously, the wider you make it, the more space you're taking up on your desktop. <coughs> Functionality, it does the obvious things. It switches tasks. It will minimize and maximize and restore windows. You can move windows. You can set the priority on the windows. The priority is set per session. In other words, there's at this point in time no database that would save it so that every time something came up, um, the pr priority would get set automatically. Uh, that's been a feature request that I have. I'm looking at how possible it is to do something like that. Um, it also has um, DOS kill as one of the choices for closing programs. And the standalone has a run suspend choice off of its menu. So it has some of the fun functionality that X Center has. We do have some language support. Um, the languages are from the previous developer. 
And since my translation skills are zero, there are some English things on all of the menus at this point. Because the only way that I could even compile it is I had to add the uh, proper uh, menu items once I'd added them within the program. So uh, if anybody happens to pick this up and can translate those few words and send them to me, I'd appreciate it. Known issues, this one we talked about the other day. This is the, the attempt to minimize and maximize back on the original virtual desktop. And I talked about the odd things that it does. <clears throat> other known issues. It was developed, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily an issue. The way that the original developer put it together, he loaded the, um, all the any information into OS2 any instead of into a private any file. And also because he loaded a huge struct in there, if I change something in that struct, I can't use the old any file entries because they're no longer compatible. Some of this stuff will come up in the wrong place. So that is something that I'm going to take care of for this next. I'm going to go to individual entries, both for backward compatibility and also because it works a little better and it'll have its own any file. The, the plugin has always had its own any file and I'm not quite sure why they were done differently. Uh, planned enhancements, um, some the help the help choice is missing from a couple of the menus. Not sure why, and I'm going to look at putting tile and cascade in so that it will have all the functionality of the Windows list. Well, actually, interestingly, in this case, you have the choice move, and if you hit move, it goes out and finds it, and you just pull it in. So you get kind of the same, you get the same same result. And the dark text that you can't read at the bottom just tells you that it's in the standalone and on in settings is where the help buttons are missing or help menu items are missing. And thanks, the code is up on NetLabs. Anyone who would like to contribute to it is welcome. Give me just a second here. I've got these in separate. Next, going to talk a little about FM2. Um, it's a file manager. It was originally developed by Mark Kimes, um, and then Steve Levine took it over for a long time. Steve still works on it, as does John Small, but I'm probably the person who does the bulk of the development. Object creation. This is something that has changed recently. It's actually a nice feature within it. You can go in and essentially inst do the object install for a program. You can go in and pick three executables, the help files, and everything like that, and, and say create real object. And it will pull up a dialog box that allows you to give it a folder name and tell it where to put that folder and it will simply create the folder and all the objects in one operation. And so basically you've installed at least the object end of a thing. The big, the change that I've made recently is if you pick a, ja a Java jar file, it will actually make the executable for you. You have to pick first the um, executable, the Java executable you wish to use since there's a bunch of different choices at this point. Um, <coughs> but it will remember your choice and it will use that one from then on unless you consciously go in and change it. And there's a menu item for changing it. <coughs> um, and you also then are out, you're then prompted to select the icon for that particular object. 
the problem I have with it is that if you open the properties before the desktop gets reset, the icon goes away and eventually where Glacial blows up. Not a good thing. So I off also offer to reset the desktop for you when uh, following the install. <laughs> Oops. File viewing, we have a lot of file viewers. Um, part of the problems, though, that occur with it relate to MMOS2, as I talked about the other day. I had to take FM2 play out because, um, as far as MMOS2 was concerned, everything was an MP3. <clears throat> um, and JPEGs don't open because uh, the JPEG I.O. doesn't report anything as far as what it can open. It doesn't say yes or no, because the section of code was left out apparently. At least that's what Steve told me when he was looking through it. We do a lot of different file viewing. Um, FM2 has a set of associations, which is kind of a nice feature because you can hit control, double click on something, and get the workplace shell association. If you just double click on it, you get the um, FM2 association. So if part of the time you want a bitmap associated with an editor, you can make that the association for FM2. And if the rest of the time you want it associated with PM view, for example, that would be your workplace shell association. And so you just have to remember whether to hit control or not to get which the one that you really want for that particular time. Commands is also a nice feature. I have things like build level where I can just put a you know, pick something in a, in the directory um, <clears throat> container and pick the command build level, and it'll give me the build level data for that particular file. So, and you can do all kinds of things like that with it. Toolboxes are simply, it's got a big button bar that um, you can change that whole bar with a two keystrokes. And it has all the basic um, file, fun file functions that you would expect that it would have. Um, added a couple of menu enhancements this in the last release. Um, and you also have the ability to put in certain tools, like if you have a compare file tool that you particularly like, you can just make it the default for the for the compare within this program. <clears throat> we can view bunches of different kinds of files. I uh, made a few um, fixes to the archiver file, mostly cosmetic, uh, had some string handling issues. It handles 12 different types of archives, assuming that you have the executables to handle those files. It, it's a front end to the command line archivers that are available for OS2. So you have to have somewhere in your path those command line archivers in order for this to work. You can actually, since it's a standalone program, you can use it as the association in um, workplace shell to for all your archiver types as an archiver viewer. <coughs> Any files, um, regular and extended attributes. We now show the critical attribute. Like I said, I couldn't find one. I probably looked at 60 different files because I just wanted to see what it looked like because Steve Levine actually is the one who ad added it, so I wanted to see what he had done. And uh, never found one. Probably, probably don't exist. And I, I don't have any idea how you pr how you set the flag either. Well, I could probably I could probably look at it. It's probably an API somewhere. Um, seek and scan files is a nice search engine. Not as good as something like Grep, but it's good for a lot of things, especially if you're doing a quick search for a single file that you don't quite remember the name of or don't quite remember where you put it. <clears throat> uh, 
the bookshelf viewer is kind of nice. You can pull up all your help files that are in the help paths. It just pulls up the list of them so that you can just scroll through them and figure out which one it was that you were really looking for. And as you can see, the ones with the asterisk, there's a standalone version. In other words, you can run it without running FM2 itself. Some drive organization tools, we have directory size, and we have a see all files, which shows you all the files on a single drive. So if you're trying to get all the temp files off of a drive or something like that, you can pull them up quickly, short by, sort by dot temp, or just filter all the dot temp and delete them all at the same time without having to look through multiple directories. The collector can do similar things. Have a collection of system tools. Um, check disk and partitioning and formatting, they just call the external um, tools that are already in ECS. Um, the partitioning will call DFC if it finds it on the drive. So you do have some options beyond just the base ones. So basically all of the tools on those are dependent on ECS functions with the exception of instant CMD, which is just you can write a command file and then execute it just in a dialog box. So if you just wanted to run four or five lines of code once and didn't want to type them all in at a prompt, you can just put them into that and execute it. <coughs> it can be configured for different uh, text, for different tasks. Um, because you can use the command line, that's what that dash x um, unique directory, my any dot any is. Um, you can have different FM2 any's by using that command line task. So if you had two or three completely different setups, there's several hundred any entries for FM2 that are part of its configuration. So you could have three or four completely different configurations for different purposes where you would just put that any in the object um, par parameters line and just double click on it and you'd have the one that you wanted. I'm sorry, I, I'm a bit later. I just was getting a cup of tea. Um, there are two questions here on IRC. You want to answer them or do you want to answer them later? I can answer them now. Uh, DBANet is asking here, Greg, have you ever thought of implementing some API so that PM applications would be able to alert and gain attention by, for example, blinking its corresponding button on the uh, switcher with some color? I have not looked at that type of an option. Um, I would be happy to look at it if uh, you, you'd like to put a um, ticket in on the L switcher site on NetLabs, um, giving me a description of what it is you would like. I can look at how possible it might be. And he has another question. He says, another but kind of new feature, if I recall correctly, the uh, correctly first incorporated in Windows Vista, a windowed application can report their progress and the switcher draws a tiny progress bar onto the corresponding button. So he's asking if you would also basically consider that as a feature request. I'm, I'm happy to look at all feature requests. Um, you need to put them in as a ticket because I won't remember an hour from now that I was asked this. Um, so. If you go ahead and do that, I'm happy to look at it. I, at this point, without looking at what it would take to implement it, I can't really tell you whether I'll be willing to or not. <coughs> Anything else you have there? No, those are the two questions. Okay. It's the classic thing for everybody, open the ticket. <laughs> Pretty much. <coughs> and just some other quick things. Um, it's really infinitely customizable, probably for some people too customizable. Um, but it does have a um, quick settings. In fact, even the way I have mine set up is a, is a choice of a single button. And the way that Mark Kimes had his set up is also a choice of a single button. 
I'm not sure, sure how close it comes anymore to how he really would have had it set up because there have been quite a few options and features added since he last worked on it. But, and there's some other types of things in there. Many apps can have different settings. In other words, if you if you want your standalone, um, if when you're in FM2 you want Editor 1 for some reason, and then if you're in just the um, archive viewer you want a different editor to be opened if you try to edit a file, you have that as an option. You can put two different editors in, or if one of them you want to use just the default editor that's in. Um, FM2. The default editor, I'm not sure I really recommend it. It's, it's fine for, you know, changing a couple of words in a text file, and the viewer is fine. There are, but you can replace both of those, and in most cases there are better ones out there than what's already in it. But they both work. Recent things that we've changed. Um, basically, I've, we put unlock in so that you can unlock EXEs and DLLs that are locked so that you can copy over them. Um, except that uh, when it was originally put in, um, we decided we'd see if we could unlock things that can't be unlocked. In other words, everything that isn't an EXE or a DLL. So you would try to unlock it and then, of course, have it followed by the error message that the file was locked. So that's been corrected. It no longer will try to unlock anything but DLLs and EXEs. And I also got rid of a collection of uh, bogus error messages that would come up after you told it either to do it or not to do it. It would, it would come back and, under different circumstances, give you an error that it had failed even if you'd told it not to do it. And it wasn't because it tried. It just was because of where the error message was. <clears throat> Some other enhancements. Um, we've added warning dialogues, which are, which are actually turned off. You have to go in and actually turn them on if you want to be warned if you're copying over or a read-only file. FM2, by default, has always simply deleted them if you said you wanted them deleted. So there is now a warning in there if that's important to you. Uh, probably most important if you're like deleting a tree and have forgotten about something that's in that tree that you probably really don't want to delete. And not by design, but the way it has ended up is if I delete a tree, it will rewarn me each time it gets into a new directory with a read-only file and it'll tell you what the file is. Um, I'm not sure whether I call that a feature or a bug, but uh, and fix some traps. I still have some going on. Um, performance enhancements and traps we, that we've fixed, and then these are a couple of other things that were fixed. Um, move to trash can, which is an option, only works on local drives. It doesn't work on network drives, so it creates some confusion. And that's a limitation of the trash can, not a limitation of FM2. But I don't think that that was made real clear when we first added that this feature. Um, Read-only check was not working correctly. It's been fixed in 2.3. And like I said, it probably didn't have much impact on anybody because it was turned off by default anyways. Actually. This is the wrong file. Now that I'm this far in, I can tell.
some issues. Um, I'm trying to put um, remote workplace shell, Rick Walsh's access basically into the workplace shell interface into it, and I actually have it pretty much implemented. The problem that I've run across is that if you reset the desktop, it completely tears the icons out. And unfortunately, if that was all it did and all I had to do was rescan, I'd be okay, but it also seems to make the workplace shell unstable when it comes back up. And Rich hasn't answered me back. Does anybody, has anybody worked with this and have any idea if there's a way to work around this? Um, I mean, the icon associations are really nice to have in FM2 to be able to, you know, see what the, because I actually have it set up as a toggle so that the, the FM2 associations are visible when you don't push the control key, and when you push the control key, the icons change to the, um, to the uh, associations that are in workplace shell. But it pulls in the icons, even for the FM2 associations, it, call, it pulls in the icon for that particular program, no matter which set of associations you're doing. So that's why that if, when it resets workplace shell, and it seems obvious to me, I'm sure that that unloads the DLL that provides the, the functionality is why it happens. In other words, why it happens is, is pretty obvious to me. The problem is is figuring out a way to work around it because I really can't guarantee that everybody will shut down FM2 universally on a desktop restart. Obviously, I don't, or I wouldn't know this happened. Um, the reason I say the potential for heat check hell is that's what I'm in currently. I have a heap corruption that occurs that I can't find where. And so I keep putting in heap checks. It is kind of nice. It traps heap check. <coughs> and does anybody have an exa any example code for using container deltas? Hmm? Container Delta is, is a system that um, exists in the interface whereby I can have only part of the container information loaded and ready to load. And the Delta is, is once it gets within whatever number I were to pick, but say 50 container items of the next bunch it gets, it goes out and gets that next bunch. But there are things like I have to still have the total count of what would be in the container if it was full. This relates to some other things like um, if you have more than 32,000 items in a container, scroll doesn't work. I mean, the only thing that works is you can, you can actually grab the scroll bar and pull it down, but the arrows at the bottom and top don't work and the scroll wheel doesn't work. Interestingly, it does work if, if you use scrolling set to as if it was arrow keys. But if it's set to scroll, it doesn't work. Um, uh, there's some indication that that's, it's really an A mouse program or problem because it doesn't happen to Steve and he uses the single mouse driver. And so we haven't completely figured out what's going on with that particular issue. Again, on NetLabs, welcome to contribute code. <coughs> um, it's done in OpenWatcom now. Whenever you need to change, I've got two more things I can do, but if you're behind and you need to get Lewis on, I'm fine. Sorry, what are you trying to do? 
I'm just opening the next presentation. They're just cut into different presentations. EFT2 is a fork of a fork of FTE. Um, the Linux people forked FTE into EFTE, which was developed for substantially longer than FTE was, though FTE is now under development again, um, interestingly, but it was for about eight or nine years wasn't touched while EFTE was developed. Then I started working on EFTE and the Linux boys didn't want my code so I forked the, it out into an FM2 project. And I've probably gotten it to the point now that you probably, it wouldn't run on Linux because obviously I have no way of testing that and never made any effort to avoid breaking anything like that. It's uh, just a text editor. It's, um, you know, has folding. Um, there's a VIO and a PM version. So kind of whichever way you prefer to do your text editing. It's got highlighting for all of the things you would expect. Um, you know, it's got column cut and paste, line edits, Again, everything you would pretty much expect out of a program editor, yeah. Uh, the previous FTE for the text editor uh, had a problem in Rex, since I use Rex a lot, with dual end, that it wouldn't align dual end. Uh, the, the Rex highlighting and stuff has been extensively reworked. I can't tell you for certain that I fixed that particular bug because I'm not sure I was aware of it. But um, if you, um, I, I keep coming up with excuses why this doesn't get released. In other words, I always have one more thing that I want to fix. And I think I've come to the conclusion I simply need to release it and let you guys tell me what it is that I need to fix. and. Uh, so if you, sh if you shoot me an email, I'll send it to you. Because I, I can actually email it. It's that small. <laughs> and it's got some abbreviations. Probably the one nice set of things it has in that most text editors aren't going to have is it actually has abbreviations for um, OS that are OS2 specific. Because it was originally, FTE was originally written for FM2 or OS2. I've got a question how much feedback do you get in terms of tickets from people after they test their software or use it? None. None. Actually, actually, that's not true. I have gotten some tickets um, on L Switcher. And I very rarely will get a ticket on FM2 that isn't done by one of the three developers. Probably. 2% of the tickets have been done by people other than one of us. So I, I can't say it's none, but it's not huge. And we actually really appreciate getting the tickets because it, it gives us some idea. Well, first of all, it lets me know that somebody's actually using it or actually would like to try to use it. And by the way, heard the same thing from Paul Smedley just recently again. He keeps porting software. I mean, the guy is like a software factory. The guy keeps pumping out new updates, all kinds of useful applications. But then you see that. No. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's it's kind of like a self-inflicted wound part in the community that people say there's no software, but there's in fact there's a lot. And he actually takes the trouble to send out a message once in a while. There is a new update. NetLab sends out its NetLab's newsletter. So in that perspective, those are a couple of developers that do send out messages. I'm here, get my products free of charge, but then the amount of feedback is basically slimmed down to half percent or less. So yeah. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. Oh, that's okay. I keep repeating that. There's. There are a lot of command line features so you can customize things on opening so you can open to places that you want to. You can order, 
Um, you can save histories, which are the, the histories of different um, operations you've called and things like that, a search histories and things like that. In other words, anything, anything where you would expect that if you pull down the tab that there'd be stuff that you had done before. Um, it runs command lines, it'll run your compiler. So if you had a co compiler command line in, in your history, you can just pull it down the next time and, and run it as opposed to having to type it back in. Um, the mode just tells which, um, which you want, which uh, highlighting and things you want it in. Um, and this one allows you to specify um, the root. The, the menus and everything are structured in configuration files. The configuration files are all plain text files. Those plain text files start from a root that's called my main. What this is is just a way to say, I'm going to use a different root file. And then what my main does is it calls the whole, tr they just get called through a whole tree of files. Several other things. The history file that I talked about, or that's the history file. Um, you can load ta tags if you wish. The rest of these are pretty standard. And these are the my files that have been added in. This is um, these are new since FTE, and what it is is an attempt to remove all the things that you would change from the regular files, so that if I update the rest of them you're not left with your choice of either taking my updates or your, your own changes and maybe not even realizing that you're making that choice when you install it. So this was a way, unfortunately, it's, it's still not flawless. There's still a handful of things that you would have to change in the main. In, in main. To edit the configuration, it, I always, this is one of the recommendations I make, is you pull it up, you edit it, and then you try to open another copy while leaving this copy open. You can open multiple different copies. They all have whatever configuration they found when they open, so they can be different. The reason I do that is inevitably I will have put a typo into the configuration file, which means now it won't open at all. But since I'm holding that configuration file open in one of the editors, I can just simply go back and change it after I find out that it doesn't work without having to jump through a bunch of hoops because I've just broken my editor. I just keep it in two different places, but that's... <laughs> Guess that was it. <laughs> I didn't think it was, but... Interesting. Anyway, like I said, it's under active development because I fix whatever bugs that I find for me, but I haven't released it. Part of it's been because I've restructured the configuration files about 12 different ways, and I, I don't want, I want to actually be at a place that I'm really comfortable with the way they're structured because, as you might imagine, the easiest way for me to break somebody's uh, install is to do a massive reconfigure of how the um, configuration files are laid out. So that's um, what I'm working on. Other thing when I do release it is it's set up for internationalization. The problem is I can't translate any of it, but the translations just need to go in about six of the configuration files which I have put out into directories that indicate what language I'd like them in. And actually, there is a Spanish translation. Um, 
where you can just take the English files which are in there and somebody could just quickly change them to whatever language and they're not really very big which would be all the menus within the so in other words you could reconfigure your are you looking for translators to translate those files I would love to have translators translate those files talk to Lewis because I understood from Jacques van Leeuwen from uh, a member of the Dutch uh, O2 user group that uh, Arkno has put up a mailing list for translators and they are translating the Yummy software into other languages so maybe you can hop on board there and ask for their uh, input at least you can get a Dutch version or you have that already no, I have just a Spanish version. And these are just, uh, I guess I should put the slides back up here. <coughs> A collection of miscellaneous things that I've done, and it's not really a comprehensive list, but gives you an idea of some of the other things that I'm either doing or thinking about trying to do. Uh, multimedia, like I said, I've got the MMIO MP3 fixed. Anybody who wants it, I have it on a thumb drive. I have the whole install package on a thumb drive, the one that's going to go on Hobbs when I get home. So just ask me afterwards. Um, Flack and Borb, we, um, I want to update the libs. The libs have been changed, but the Unix boys think that backward compatibility is bullshit as far as I can tell. Um, it was the Flack one changed all the function names. So now I have to go back and figure out what functions they are and redo all of the function calls. So that should be really fun. So that's going to take me a little longer than I had hoped. I'd hoped to just put the lib in and recompile, not get a bunch of name errors. <laughs> and then I'm going to look at seeing if I can use how the audio ones were done to actually see if I can make FMMPEG work using the same basic model. In other words, I won't do, uh, I won't, for the codex itself, I won't do anything. It, it will all be that, but it's just an attempt to plug it in actually as an I.O. system. I don't know if it's even possible, but something I think I'm going to try. Um, I'd like to get the JPEG I.O. source um, to see if I can fix the one issue with it where it doesn't report what it does. And I discovered all of these because I was reworking image exe, which is an old file of Mark Kimes, because I was gonna I was just gonna plug it into FM2 as a as just a module within FM2 um, to do the you know quick uh, picture viewings and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I could, but I, I had the, I have the source code for IMB uh, for image, and so I just was playing around with it, and that was what I was going to do with it. And as a result of playing around with it, that's how I found out about all these other broken things. Um, it oh, fixed the score. By the way, short okay, I, I have like four more slides. Um, some issues that I fixed with um, X Center plugins, and then the last handful are um, some things that I did for ECS, the front end of the DFC disk checker at the very beginning of the install program, and then I fixed the backward compatibility with Boot Manager. Compatibility. Set Boot. Remember the quotes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember asking. Steve maybe pointed it out to me. So. Yeah. Now, the, the, um, the air boot, set boot, which was supposed to be backward compatibility with, with boot manager, 
if you had a space in the name and failed because there was no quoting text in it. And I added the quoting stuff back in. So there's a fixed version where it doesn't do that if you're still running Boot Manager. So that covers everything unless people have questions. Only if you want a copy of, the, of that set boot, I have that.